Hi, this is Harold. Welcome to Transformation's weekly message and podcast. I'm glad you are making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end of today's message, but for now, let's see what God wants to teach us. May God bless your hearing, understanding, and application of God's word and message. Hello, friends. Pastor Harold here. Man, I got a head cold. My head feels like it's going to explode. I'm on cold medicine. So if I sound all clogged up, it's because I am all clogged up. But hey, man, we're glad you're with us anyway. I hope you can bear my voice through our message time today. We are in a message series that's titled Faith in Action. And it's it's centered on the Bonhoeffer movie, Dietrich Bonhoeffer movie that's coming out on Thanksgiving. And if you haven't checked it out, you can YouTube it, Google it. It's great. It's a great message about a pastor, a spy, and an assassin. It's the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And it's going to be great. And uh, so we're going to do a two-part message in it. Uh, This one will air on the 23rd, November. And then we'll do a live message on the 24th. And then the 24th in the afternoon, we're going to the theater to actually see it as a large group. So somewhere in there, if you're watching this, whether you're local with us or you're abroad somewhere, hopefully you can find a way and a means to see this movie tied into this message series and see if it makes a difference in your faith journey and how your life turns out. Uh, but that's what we're going to dive into. So this is two parts. So part one's today. Part two will be next Sunday. And the sermon title for today is Faith in Action. And it's living out Bonhoeffer's call to justice. And so that's what we want to focus on today. So again, today's message, Faith in Action. So I want to say good morning to everyone. And I'm we're starting this two-part series, and we're glad you're a part of it. Again, our message today is Faith in Action. And we're going to explore the legacy and the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. A theologian who was also a pastor whose faith compelled him to stand against the regime, the injustice of Nazi Germany. And it's a powerful story of what faith looks like in action. And Bonhoeffer's life reminds us that faith is not passive or abstract. You know, it's not just some fundamental idea or to sit back and watch and pray. It calls us to action, especially in the face of evil and injustice. So we're without excuse as Christians. You know, we're called to be in action. We're called, our, our faith should be a verb. You should be a verb. If you're a Jesus-centered follower, following a Jesus-looking God, living in the kingdom of God, helping to advance the kingdom, your life should be a verb. And if it's not, then you're really missing the boat. And I'll just call it out. That's exactly right. You're missing the boat. Bonhoeffer once said, and I quote, Christianity stands or falls with its revolutionary protest against violence, arbitrariness, and pride of power, end quote. He believed the church must be a voice for the voiceless, advocating for justice and mercy in a broken world. And Bonhoeffer's life was a beacon of courageous faith in a time, friends, of complacency and complicity, especially when it comes to the church itself. So he stood for a lot. Uh, and I think the movie will portray that. I've seen the trailers for the movie. I haven't seen the movie, but I think they're going to do a good job with it. So over the next two weeks, we'll reflect about what living out your faith actually means. And of course, it's contextual. It's where you're at. But today we're going to focus on the call to justice and exploring how our faith must extend beyond belief and into a tangible action. So first it starts with inventory. What are the injustices going on around me in your community? Start with that. What are they? Name them. you got to name it before you can claim it. But what are the injustices that are going on right now where you're at, the zip code you're in, where you call home, where you plant a flag, What's going on around you? That's What are the injustices? And you see them, you hear about them, you read them, just Google them. What are the injustices in my county? I'm in Jefferson County, Missouri. What are they? And I can tell you that right here where I'm at right now, there's 2,500 people that are homeless in this county. There are people that are suffering from addiction, alcoholism, and mental health issues galore with not a lot of services available to them. Sure, if they got a job and insurance, they can go to a local treatment center for 30 days, maybe longer. Maybe even get into a halfway house. If they have insurance or if they have means, then they can. But if they don't have any means, they've burnt their life into the ground, they don't have any resources, then there's nothing for them. And so they just keep doing what they're doing. They live in the woods, they live on the streets, and their chances of recovery are slim to none. That would be an injustice in our, in our culture. Is it our fault they're addicts or alcoholics? No. Is it our responsibility to pay for their negligence or, or their, their lack of thereof? Not necessarily, but it is our job to help them be restored. 
to meet them where they're at, walk shoulder to shoulder with them and help them take the next steps on their journey. So that's what it means to be just. So it isn't a judgment thing. That's up to God. Our job is to meet people where they're at and help them take the next steps. And that's what this is about. So yeah, there's some radical stuff that if you're you're killing a, a segment of people, that's definitely an injustice, obviously. Or you're enslaving a, a segment of people, that's an injustice. We would agree with that. But there are things that are falling into the category of injustice that don't necessarily that aren't that 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 clear. Again, people that are suffering mental illness, addiction, alcoholism is one example. Or homelessness. Why are they homeless? Well, forty six percent forty six percent of people that are homeless. Or it's transitional. They lost a job. They became disabled. It's a spouse dies. Something tragic happened. The company went out of business. Whatever. And now they just don't have enough resources. And now and there's more month than there is money. And now they're stuck in a situation. And now they're just living out of hotels, couch surfing, or living out of their car. They're homeless. So what are you going to do? So you can sit there in inventory and go, well, they shouldn't be that way. If they would have done this right, if they would have done that right, they wouldn't be in that situation. That's easy to say when you're on top of the mountain. But that's not the Christian calling. Our call is to meet them where they're at and help them get restored however we can. And we can't be all things to all people, but if we can play in even a small role in helping them take the next step, then that's what it's about. So I want to focus on three things today. Faith without action is dead, number one. Number two, the call to justice for all of us as kingdom people. And number three, the radical love and action. So that's the three things we're going to hit on today. Let's start with faith without action is dead. Faith without works is dead. We know that comes from the book of James, five books in the book of James. This is chapter 14 through 17, but it's also mentioned in other parts of that, that reading. And I want to read the scripture. Here it is. And I quote James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Quote, what good is it, brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can that faith save him? Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. End quote. Powerful statement. And so James' words challenge us to consider the authenticity of our faith. Is, is, my, is there fruit in my life? Is there, is there walk with the talk, if you would? Is there evidence that I'm living out this life? In Bonhoeffer's life, he lived this truth, understanding that the faith demands action, not just intellectual assent, right? He, he, it, there should be validation. There should be authenticity. There should be demonstration in your life that you're living this out. And for him, belief in Jesus required active resistance against evil, especially the evil that you're right in front of. And he couldn't stay silent while witnessing the rise of Hitler and the persecution of innocent people. A persecution, if you watch the news or are relevant at all today, you know still goes on for the people of Jewish descent. Right now with all the stuff in Gaza, many Jews were persecuted right here in the United States alone. So this injustice is still going on. It just looks different, but it's still the same result. So what do we do with that? How do you stand up for that? But at the same time, you got the Palestinians that live over in Gaza who are being de demised and, and destroyed and, and killed. What about those people? And that's an injustice for those people. So trying to find solidarity, trying to be a peacemaker and all that, I think is a real kingdom calling. Uh, one that political leaders have to deal with and are they going to deal with it in a power struggle, in a power format, or are they going to deal with it in a kingdom way? Well, we, we can only hope it's in a kingdom mindset. Bonhoeffer's involving in the confessing church, if you would, which resisted Hitler's influence over the German church, exemplifies the principle. I mean, he exemplified what it means to stand for injustice. And it means to stand in solidarity with those who are being disenfranchised, who are being marginalized, who are being tortured abused and killed. I mean, standing shoulder to shoulder with them. So it's not just off at a distance, hey, we'll pray for you, but it's walking shoulder to shoulder with these people. He argued that the church's silence in the face of Nazi atrocities made it complicit. So you were part of the problem. If you're sitting there and saying nothing, doing nothing, then you're just as much a part of the problem. And he couldn't stay silent while witnessing the rise of Hitler and the persecution of innocent people, right? So he believed faith must be lived out in courage, even if it meant putting his own life at risk. So if that's what it meant, so what? So be it. So imagine a church that sees injustice but does nothing. Might even be your church right now, wherever you're at. We'll pray about it, you say. Bonhoeffer would argue that, that cop, that's a cop-out, that it's faith incomplete. All you're going to do is pray for me? You're going to pray about it, but you're not going to do anything? There, there needs to be teeth with that prayer, right? 
And, you, and, and, and true pr faith propels us into a world that embodies Jesus and it embodies Jesus' love and embodies Jesus' justice for all. And so there's got to be traction there. He once said, and I quote, silence in the face of evil is e itself evil, end quote. So God meant for our faith to make a difference, friends. And so that's an inventory question. Does my faith make a difference in the world? And if you don't know the answer to that question immediately, then probably not, or not at the level it should. And you should take that seriously. And what needs to happen starting today to change that? And there's lots of things you can be doing. So take a moment to consider where can we actively live out our faith in our own lives and where we can challenge injustice or serve our neighbors in a Christ-like way, with Christ-like love. So again, going back to your context, where do you live? What's going on? What are the injustices? How can you step into that? Whether that's partnering with another group that's already trying to stand up for injustice or it's creating something brand new. But where can you fit? How can you act? What can you do starting today? So the next point I want to reach out is called, you know, is the call of justice. Then we're going to look at two scriptures, Isaiah 1, 17 and Micah 6, 8, 1 that most people are familiar with. So let me start with Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, and I quote, Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause, end quote. So again, it's very contextually what's going on in Isaiah's time. Micah 6, 8. And I quote, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God, end quote. So Bonhoeffer saw these scriptures as mandates for God's people. It's a call to action. Get busy, friends. That's what he's saying. He recognized that faith that it does not seek justice isn't aligned with God's heart. So if you're just talking to talk but not walking the walk, then you're, you're disconnected spiritually. And Bonhoeffer was deeply influenced by the African-American church in New York of his time, which gave him firsthand experience of a community fighting for injustice. So if you're around and you're listening to this message, you know that injustice for people of color is real. If you don't know that, I don't even know what to tell you. If you don't think that's true, then come and find me and I will prove it to you in five minutes. The difference of what it means to be white and what it means to be a person of color. Still today, in America, all these years, displaced from slavery, injustice still is very much alive. It just might look different. It may not be as deep, uh, harsh, but it's still there, and it still impacts people in a negative way, and it can be deadly for people. So really important. So this experience that he had in New York shaped his resolve to resist the Nazi regime upon returning to Germany. So it shaped him. And so, again, you look back at the injustice to the homeless, to the, to the mental health patients, to the alcoholics, to the addicts, to the LBGTQ plus community. When you, can say, when you can argue all day, well, that, that's sexual sin, so that's sin. But there's still people. And if they're being punished, if they're being marginalized, if they're being beat up, if they're being killed because of where they're at in life, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, it's still not right. And they're still a minority. They're still suffering injustice and you can argue well they're bringing it upon themselves well that's a whole different discussion but but that that's irrelevant it's like saying somebody who's dying from hunger well if they'd only worked they'd have food well but that didn't solve their problem now and they need something to eat and we all need clean water to drink and we all want a warm shower to take and we all want a roof over our heads you know we all want to be loved we all want to be respected that's just normal human response to life and when those things are absent in somebody's life, it's an injustice. The Bible will make that clear time and time and time again. So don't cop out on, oh, that's a sin, because I can easily pull back the blinds in your life, brother, sister, in about two seconds and show you all kinds of sin. You know, so let's, let's, that's the pot calling the kettle black. Let's don't go there. Let's stay in the fact that God calls us to a bigger calling in our life. Think about Bonhoeffer witnessing the struggle for racial equality in America. He saw parallels to the fight in Germany, right? He saw the parallels and he became convinced that Christians should resist systemic evil, period, no matter where, when, or how. And he once wrote, and I quote, we are not simply to bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice 
we are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself, end quote. So for him, following Christ meant more than comforting victims. It meant standing up for injustice itself. And what does that look like? That's more than just a Facebook post, friends. That's more than just a video on Snapchat or TikTok. That's out walking shoulder to shoulder with people and helping them rediscover life in whatever segment you're in. You can't be all things to all people. Where are you called? Where, what's going on in your context right now? You can go stand shoulder to shoulder with people and help them get out from underneath whatever they're underneath. What is it? That's what we need to be looking at. For him, following Christ meant more than comforting victims. It meant standing up for injustice itself. As we reflect on his example, let's ask ourselves this question. Where is God calling us to drive a spoke into the wheel of injustice in our communities? And what can we do individually as a church to seek justice or correct oppression? And for me, in my context, number one, it's the homeless and, and the injustices. Nobody's doing anything to help them get out from underneath where they're at. There's churches doing charity. We'll give you food. You know, we'll do this for you. But but there's nobody building houses and helping these people get a home. And, and all the statistics prove that they had a home, especially those 46% that are transitional, that their lives would flip immediately. So what's what's going on to help them do that? To help them have a safe place to call home, a roof overhead. Not a mansion, not a luxury situation, but just a place to lay their head that's safe and comfortable. That's number one. The mental illness crisis in our in our world, but definitely in our community. And people suffer from all kinds of stuff, but they don't have any resources. A lot of them don't have insurance. Um, they don't have a means to even talk to anybody. And, and the shame and the stigma that goes with their lifestyle or the choices they made and the brokenness that they suffer from, they're not gonna reach out to anybody anyway. So what, but, but, but a response to that is, what are we doing to trying to solve that? To create a space where they can get help and they can get the support and get on track and get on the beam of life, get mentored, get sponsored, get discipled, however you want to frame it, and get back into the game of life. Become re citizens, be restored. That is the real million dollar question. What can we do? And that's the question you're asked. What can you do starting today that's going to make a difference in how somebody else's life turns out, not your own? And the cool part about that is God doesn't bring two people together to only bless one of them. So when you're focused on that person, you're going to be blessed in response. It's not our motivation for doing it. It's just part of the reciprocation of the, of the action. And so it's powerful. And the last point I want to lift up is radical love and action, referring to Matthew 25, 35 through 40. And here's the scripture reading. I quote, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me, end quote. So in this passage, Jesus reveals that, that caring for the most vulnerable is in the heart of discipleship. I've been a volunteer in corrections for over 30 years. On average, in a confined space, once or twice a week with the marginal lives the criminals per se, the addicts, the alcoholics, the people that are just made poor choices that are in a confined space, whether it's treatment, whether it's in a prison system, but going into those spaces and meeting them where they're at and trying to bridge a gap, trying to help them take the next steps on their journey, however small a piece that is. But that's what that looks like, right? This is Matthew 25 being lived out. In this passage, Jesus reveals that caring for the most vulnerable is at the heart of discipleship. It's at the heart of it, right? And Bonhoeffer took this teaching seriously. His resistance to the Nazis, even to the point of risking his life, was an act of love for the oppressed. He wasn't just content to preach about love. He took action by working to bring down Hitler's regime, even knowing the consequences. So Bonhoeffer's participation in the plot to assassinate Hitler may seem shocking, it's like, well, if you're a Christian, why would you try to kill some of it? But he wrestled deeply with the moral implications of that. And the movie will portray that. Or if you read his biography. So I don't want to give away the, 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 the juice there. But, but, but think about that. Ultimately, he believed that inaction in the face of such horrific evil was in itself a sin. So you got a killer on the loose and nobody's doing anything. And you're contemplating, should I kill this guy? Because the Bible says I shouldn't murder. But he's, he's killing people. So if I take out one and save a bunch, isn't that justice? 
Well, I'll let you decide that. I think we're all supposed to be peacemakers, but how do you work that in there? Well, that's something to wrestle with scripturally, theologically. You need to wrestle with that. But this is where he landed. He lived out his radical love, Jesus calls us to, caring for the least of these in the time those being persecuted in Germany. So he lived it out. That was his context. He was right in the middle of all that. And so the application piece of that is faith and action requires love that goes beyond comfort, right? How are we living out Jesus' command to care for the least of these in the world? Are you willing to step out of your comfort zones to bring hope and relief to those in need? And the proof is in the pudding. Not, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Count me in, Lord. Put me in, coach. No, it's you being proactive and making that happen. So in conclusion, faith that transforms world is what we're about. And reflecting on Bonhoeffer's life and his commitment to justice, it's clear that faith cannot remain hidden. Friends, it's got to be a verb. It's got to be an action. And Bonhoeffer challenged us to take our faith and propel it into action. True discipleship means standing against injustice, loving others radically, and pursuing God's kingdom with courage. And Bonhoeffer's story isn't just a, 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 a chapter of history. It's, it's a call to each of us. It's an example. It's a demonstration of what it means to follow a Jesus-looking God and live a Jesus-centered life. Right? That's exactly what it is. So as followers of Jesus, we're invited to embody our faith in a way that brings hope, it brings justice and love to a broken world. Faith isn't just a personal belief, but it's a powerful force that transforms community and it confronts evil. So next week, we're going to go deeper into a personal cost of following Jesus. And Bob Bonhoeffer famously said, and listen, it's a powerful quote. Listen to what it says, and I quote, When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die, end quote. We'll explore what that means to embrace the cost of discipleship and how Bonhoeffer's life embodied the costly call. So we'll dive into that. We'll be doing that live next week. But our key takeaways for today is that faith demands action, right? Our faith is incomplete if it doesn't lead to action. And Bonhoeffer's life teaches us that faith requires more than words, friends. It calls us to step out and make a difference. Number two, seek justice boldly. God calls us to act justly, love mercifully, and walk humbly with God. And this command isn't just a personal command, but a mission for the church to pursue justice in a broken world. And number three, radical love is central to discipleship. Jesus identifies himself with the least, the lost, and the marginalized all throughout Scripture. As followers of Christ, Jesus calls us to show radical love that mirrors his. So I'm going to invite us to pray, and I just invite you to bow your head where you're at. And uh, you can also see on the bottom of the screen how to get a hold of us. So if we can pray for you in any way, we can help you with any injustice you're experiencing um, in your life, then reach out to us. Let us know that. And uh, we would love, especially if you're here locally. And if you're local here in the St. Louis area, then come and visit us. Come be with us and help us make a difference in the kingdom of God. We'd love to partner with you to do that. But here's how you can get a hold of us. So get a hold of us, and uh, we'll look forward to engaging with you. But for now, let's pray if we could. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of faith that goes beyond words and calls us into action. Teach us to live boldly like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, standing for justice and truth when it's complicated. Give us the courage to love radically and see your face in the least of these. May our lives reflect your heart as we seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Strengthen us to be your hands and feet, bringing your kingdom to a needy world. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Friends, go in peace and live out your faith in action. May God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Get your Bonhoeffer tickets. Go to the movie. See the movie. It'll make a difference in your faith and it'll give you a real illustration and dramatization of what it means to live the kingdom life. So God bless you. I look forward to talking to you soon. Hi again, this is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know more about us, we are Transformation Church. We are a church for people who aren't in the church. We are a Jesus-centered community made up of everyday people just like you. We refer to ourselves as transformers committed to helping God change the world. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. at our House Springs campus. 
We are moving and launching a new campus soon in Eureka, Missouri, scheduled to launch on April 6, 2025, and we would love for you to join us and be a part of this Jesus revolution. We also meet during the week in smaller groups called house churches, and that's how we make it relational. We regularly hear from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, Vimeo, YouTube, and TikTok. You can also download our app for free and for fun from your favorite app store. You can find the download link in the show notes or on our website at www.transformerforlife.org. That's www.transformer4life.org. Inside our app or on our website, you can access all our available audio and video teachings and view and download our bulletin, sermon notes, slides, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. Lastly, if you want to learn more about supporting Transformation Church with your time, talent, and finances and what it takes to become a Transformer, please visit our website. God loves generous people, and so do we. So a gift of any amount of your time, talent, and finances is much appreciated. Hey, thanks for being a member of our extended Jesus-centered community. I'm glad we are on this journey together, walking shoulder to shoulder, helping people experience a Jesus-centered life, and discovering the kingdom of God.